If you're watching this presentation live, please raise your hand and stop us. Let's uh, let's answer your questions. If you if you you know somehow doubt some of the things that we're going to present today, please let me know. Uh, but but no, the the studios that followed the regulations that we sort of the not regulations, but the re recommendations that we made uh, back at the beginning of the year, back in March of 2020, are the ones that are doing the best right now, and the ones that did the best through COVID. And and we're going to toot our own horn a little bit here on this presentation, but mostly just so that everybody who's newer at working with us now can see that going forward the same recommendations that we made in march pretty much are are the recommendations we're going to be making everybody to everybody going forward so if you need clarification on any of this uh, please raise your hand please type those questions into the chat and let's come around to you and answer those questions because we are not out of the woods yet we are on the ramp back up um, there's a lot of good news coming out right now uh, about the COVID response and, and about uh, the future the near future here, but but we're not completely out of the woods yet. And so even though, even, even as we're ramping everybody back up, the recommendations that we're making um, will hold true even if things completely open back up in your area again, okay? There's nothing on this that's, that's advice that doesn't apply to you even if you're already um, operating at 100% capacity or soon will be. Now, just a couple of really quick take-home lessons here. Uh, we ruffled a few feathers when we made some of the announcements that we made, the recommendations that we made back in March um, of 2020, and, and there were some things that we learned really, really quickly. First of all, some studios did significantly better than others through the first wave, okay? Some studios did significantly better than others through the first wave. And I've crunched a whole bunch of our numbers now. I've gone in and looked at the database for the studios that use our software to track their things. You know, we can go in there and crunch numbers and we can make relationships between studios that are doing well and studios that are not doing as well. What are the studios that are doing well doing and what are those that are not doing as well doing and all, all those kind of things. We have access to a lot of those numbers. Well, on average, the studios that are working with us in our programs they saw a decrease in gross income, gross tuition collections, I should say, of only about 20% through the summer following the COVID shutdowns. Um, I know that some of you have shared some of your stats with me in addition to that, and up through the summer, some of you, uh, some of you had a, a decrease in personal income of, of as little as 16%. And these are not studios that weren't shut down or that didn't have limitations put on them, right? These are, these are, these are locations that, that are dealing with this on the same basis that everybody else in the country is they got shut down they got limited they had uh, uh, um, uh, had to pull back on the number of, of enrollments they did they lost a bunch of students but if you follow this advice that we're going over today you'll see that you'll do significantly better than others through this second wave as we're going through whatever that means now okay now now that 20 percent drop in gross collections over the summer is not significantly different from what most studios that work with our programs do in the summer anyway. There are a lot of studios that take a much bigger hit than 20% throughout their summer collections. So keep that in mind. On average, on average, that's not even just the studios that did well, that's on average, the studios that use our software only lost about 20% of the gross collections through the summer. I realize some of you did worse than that, okay? I realize some of you did. So you pulled that average down a little bit, that's okay. I'm going to talk about how to fix that. But the other thing that happened was in September and uh, August and September of this year, we have a number of studios. We have a number of studios that hit record months in August and September. If some of you did that, type that in the chat and let us know. If you did better in August and September of COVID year than you did previous year, let us know. That was a very, very normal thing. A lot of people did that. So Important to understand here, it is possible to do well, and it is also possible to not do well as you're navigating COVID, okay? That's the take-home message there. Many people used COVID and the shutdowns and as, as an excuse to perform poorly, okay? So a lot of studios that weren't doing well before COVID, COVID hit, and then they started blaming COVID for things that, that they did have control over. And I realize that this might ruffle a few feathers again by us saying this, but we are not going to use COVID as an excuse. We can make excuses or we can be successful in our businesses. It is really hard to do both of those things. Denise says, ouch, that hurts. Yeah, I promise, Denise, it's not the only time that I'm going to ruffle some feathers, okay, there are on this presentation today. There are some things that we just, like, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to push you out of your comfort zone a little bit here. And we did see a lot of people that just kind of shut down and pulled back. Uh, because COVID gave them the option to do that. We saw a lot of businesses not in our industry do the same thing. 
They were not doing very well and COVID was finally the excuse for them to get out of the business that they were in. And what they started saying was because of COVID this and COVID that, we're finally, you know, there's nothing we could do and we're throwing in the towel when many of them just were looking for an excuse for it to not be their fault that they weren't being successful, okay? Now, do I wish that COVID had, had not come around? Of course, I wish COVID hadn't hit. Would my studio be doing better if COVID hadn't hit? Yes, I genuinely believe that my studio would be doing, my locations would be doing better as well. But, but we're gonna be finding ways to make this work in spite of that, rather than using it as an excuse, okay? All right, now, the other thing that we know now is that there was a ton of bad advice in our industry. And we have to be very, very careful who we listen to and what advice we're taking when it comes to the livelihood of our business. And there is a lot of, there are a lot of platforms out there where studios can post, you know, hey, we did this and we tried this and we did this. And you can go in there and get and go down that rabbit hole and uh, and 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 follow that rabbit hole down behind a a studio that is not doing well, right? Or somebody that doesn't even run a studio that's trying to give you good advice and has no idea what they're talking about. Um, Alice is typing in the chat here. The easiest thing to do is quit when things get hard. That's exactly right. And so we we have this framework. We'll represent it to you guys again today. We presented it in March. I'll show it to you again today that we use for making decisions when the time gets tough like this and specifically for COVID, okay? All right, so that bad advice, let's talk about that bad advice first. So we'll talk about what the bad advice was that was given out. Once again, I, I recognize that I'm probably gonna ruffle a few feathers here uh, by calling some folks out, but there was a lot of bad advice and we need to make sure that we, we recognize it as bad advice and we don't continue to follow it. First and foremost, the worst piece of advice that was being given was to decrease your tuition if enough of your students complain. And so I saw several people out in the, in the webosphere saying things like, if 10 students complain about tuition being too high during the COVID shutdowns, drop your tuition by 25%. That's insane. It was absolutely the worst piece of advice that could be given. And those people should absolutely be publicly ridiculed for giving that, that advice. It doesn't even make mathematical sense. In most cases, in that kind of, with that kind of advice, you would be better off losing the students that were complaining than dropping everybody's tuition rate. Like it just doesn't even make good mathematical sense. Don't decrease your tuition. Matter of fact, in the chat, somebody help me out here. How many of you guys raised your tuition, raised your down payments, or did something like that through COVID as opposed to decreasing your tuition through COVID? If you did that, if you don't mind typing, typing that into the chat, I'd appreciate it because I wanna drive this point home. Uh, Jenny says we did, and Jenny wasn't, this wasn't brand new. Jenny had already been implementing um, higher tuition rates before COVID hit. Look at this, chats come in. Ray saying we increased, Wendy saying changed to 12 month commitments, and saying we did, that's the, my studio did, and I'll raise my tuition again in, in a couple months here. Again, uh, Karen saying that we did it and also converted students to higher level upgraded programs. Uh, Dance Factory did it. Tony says, says she raised her tuition. Uh, yeah, tons, thank you guys for sharing that. The point is, um, the point is that was a mistake. Okay, that was bad advice. And everybody who gave that bad advice, you should not listen to them anymore. Even if it was your mother in law who loves you and cares about you and wants you to be successful, if they don't know what they're talking about, stop listening to them. Okay, decreasing tuition through COVID was a mistake. We know that. Okay, the people who did that suffered more than the people who did not. All right, permanently offering classes online or investing in expensive equipment. Now, it, this one I have to be a little bit careful with as well. This was bad advice. You know, people were saying, oh, the market's going to be shifting here. This is an opportunity. You can do classes online and sell them to people on the other side of the world and blah, 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 right? Like there was a bunch of hype about that. And then there was a bunch of hype about, you know, buy these really nice cameras and really nice mics and this really nice stuff to, to make sure that your programs online are great. That's fine. I, I absolutely have no problem with you guys out there buying expensive equipment of one kind or another to, to, to provide a better circumstance online. What I can say here is that it made no difference in the number of students that were actually retained. Now, if you think it's the right thing to do because you want to provide a high quality thing and somehow it, has, somehow it, offends, it offends your sensibilities to not have you know, really, really nice cameras broadcasting things on Zoom or some special online platform you had custom made for your students or whatever you paid a bunch of money for, that's fine. If it's because you think it's the right thing to do, do it because you think it's the right thing to do. But we saw nothing, we saw no impact on the number of students that actually retained or not, uh, based on the, the it types of inexpensive equipment or the types of expensive equipment that people invested into this. I'm not saying it was the wrong thing to do. Another example of that was people buying these like special lights for their, for their um, you know, to, to, to like 
sanitize their flooring or HVAC systems that they put in, or that people that like punched holes in their walls to put additional windows in and that ventilate their areas better. Those may all have been the right choice for you as you're trying to keep people safer. It did not like, like the idea is, you know, you and the dance, you spent more money doing things like that maybe than the studio down the street. But when the, when the county uh, health department shut you down, they shut both of you down still. Okay. And so it made very little difference in the result that we got. It may have been the right thing for quality. It may have been the right thing for safety. It may have been the right thing for that. It was not necessarily re required to, uh, to financially benefit your studio the best way, right? That's, that's the point I'm making there. Uh, the other thing was get students into free online classes. Uh, there were a bunch of, of, of um, uh, online class offerings from companies that do that, right? Here's this additional supplemental training. You can put your student in. We'll give your students a free month of training in our online platform and they can come take classes online from us. Those guys were trying to steal your students. We called it out back in March and that's exactly what happened, okay? So just getting people into some kind of free online class or, or some other companies, you know, additional training that you were adding as, as sort of additional value for some free online thing, that was, a, that was a bait to try and hook these people into these online platforms in other locations. And that went sideways in a bunch of places of of course it did, all right? Uh, there was another bunch of just sort of advice out there that was just kind of this, let's just remain positive. And my wife and I, we have this joke, we call those types of arguments, um, what we call them, we call them puppies are good arguments. Like, like you go make the argument that puppies are good. Nobody's gonna say you're wrong, but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily a helpful thing to be doing, you know? It's like, hey, just remind yourself why you got into this in the first place. And maybe this is the universe trying to teach you things. That's fine. Those things may all be true. They may all be true but they did not make a significant difference in whether or not your studio weathered the storm very well, okay? The, the take home message on this here, the, the thing I'm trying to drive home here is don't take advice from people that don't run profitable studios. Just don't do it, just don't listen to them, okay? They may have good ideas, just stop taking advice from people that don't run profitable studios. And keep in mind that I still in my life, I pay a lot of money to, uh, to my own business coaches that basically just tell me not to do stuff. And I come to them and I say, hey, I have this idea, should I do this? And they say, no. And I pay them a lot of money just to tell me no, okay? Don't take advice from people that don't run profitable studios. That was never more true than it was through COVID. If there's people out there offering advice and they're not running profitable th studios through COVID, stop taking advice from those people. Now, probably ruffling a few feathers by saying those things. I understand that. But when, when we ruffled a few feathers back in March by saying the things that we did back then and making the recommendations we did back then, I think what I wasn't completely clear about were some assumptions that we're making about your business, right? And if you have these same assumptions that I'm about to give you here, then it's a little bit easier to swallow the pill that we're gonna give you in a few minutes, okay? That we're gonna show you what you need to be doing as we're going forward. Uh, first and foremost, you don't just sell dance. I put that in quotes because I realize some of you sell other things, right? It may not be dance or martial arts or fitness or music or whatever you're doing. You do not sell that thing. You sell transformation. So what you sell is not classes, right? right? You sell transformation. You take a person and you put them in your program, whatever that is, and it's this magic black box that you've created and out pops this better human being somehow, right? There's some kind of transformation they get from your program. If that's not true and you actually just are trying to sell classes, you're doing little drop-ins for Zumba classes, you're not actually selling transformation of some kind, then you can probably just stop watching this presentation right now. It's not going to be helpful, all right? Because if you don't just sell classes, you sell some kind of transformation, then everything else we teach makes sense. If you haven't made that leap in your brain yet, then the rest of this is just going to be frustrating for most people. The other thing is that I would say that as you're thinking about your business values, that your business values need to include helping people reach their goals. You don't just run a business that teaches classes. Once again, your values include helping people to reach the goals that they've set for themselves. If those are genuinely part of your business values, then everything else we're going to teach today makes sense. If they're not, then just stop listening to what we have to say because it's probably just going to be frustrating to you, okay? The other assumption that we're making is that none of this is easy and you understand that and you think you should do it anyway. So remember I was talking a, a second ago about a lot of people who used COVID as an excuse to finally just, you know, you know cut bait and go home. And, and whatever that meant, whether that was shutting the business down or just not trying hard or just waiting until all this blows over. None of this is easy. Let's just take that assumption that this is not going to be super easy. It's not gonna be what we want to do and we should still do it anyway. And can you see how if those first two assumptions are true, that third one should be true or you're making some kind of mistake in life, man. 
like you're selling transformation to people and you're helping people reach their goals. It's not going to be easy to do that when things like COVID come up or when things like the 2008 financial crisis come up or when my spouse gets diagnosed with cancer or whatever else happens, right? We should do those things anyway because they're the right things to do. As long as we have those assumptions in place, everything else we're going to show you guys today is going to make a little bit more sense, okay? All right, now, there were some mistakes that a lot of studios made. And the biggest one that we saw was not pivoting online quickly enough. And so if you're about to get shut down again, you hopefully don't need to be told this again, but pivoting online quickly is going to be a big part of that, right? Now, I don't know that there's anybody on this call that doesn't sort of already have that part figured out, or at least understand that that's an important move that you may need to make and that you should have made from the very beginning. The studios that did not do that well did not do well through the first wave of COVID. Okay, decreasing tuition rates, we already talked about that. That was a huge mistake. People that were saying, my classes are no longer worth what they're worth because we've moved onto an online format temporarily. That was a huge mistake that a lot of people made. Another thing was changing their class schedules or decreasing offerings when they got shut down or cut back. Uh, I want you guys to imagine, I, 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 was, I, I straight up stole this idea from another, another guy that runs some some good successful martial arts studios, but he said, you know, the way that I think about this is I was just, all I did was I was imagining that I was moving my studio down the street. What would I do if I was, if I had to temporarily move my studio down the street? Let's imagine that your studio gets flooded and it ruins your flooring and it's gonna take you three weeks to go put new flooring in, okay? Let's imagine that that's what happened. And so you had to move your studio down the street a few blocks, how would you do that? You know, you wouldn't just post something on Facebook and let everybody know you were shutting down temporarily. Like you'd be on the phone talking to people and following up and all these other things, right? And so changing class schedules and increasing offerings was a mistake. We're running the same studio. We've just temporarily moved it to another location. And that happens to be Zoom or Google meetings or Facebook groups or whatever you did, okay? Like, like we just temporarily moved our location as opposed to decreasing the classes we were offering or something like that. The other thing was halting marketing and enrollment off efforts. And I realized a lot of people didn't understand how to do that, but we figured it out very, very quickly. And so running your marketing right now is the right thing to be doing, continuing to push that. I think Theo just sharing his experience a second ago is exactly right. I mean, these guys just launched some new ads a week ago. They're technically shut down and they got 18 people coming in. We have other people that are signing up, you know, dozens of students per week right now. And many of them are either shut back or have limited class sizes and they're figuring this out, okay? We need to figure that out. Don't pull back on your marketing. I know that many of you have heard me say this already. Some of you have watched our our holiday training. And if you haven't seen that, I'll send it out to you again if you need us to. But the, the take home message there was that the studios that do best in quarter four always do best in quarter one as well. So don't pull back on your marketing, don't pull back on your enrollment efforts because it's gonna build momentum as you're ramping your studio back up again now, okay? The other thing was not implementing 12 month programs. Those studios that didn't have that in place before COVID hit, they didn't have 12 month programs, 12 month commitments from students in place did not do well over the summer. They lost a bunch of students when COVID hit because these people didn't have long-term commitments in their brain. Not because we locked them into some contract, but because they were thinking about training in the long-term. A lot of people, when COVID hit and they got shut down in March and April, the, the, the summer was right around the corner, schools started getting shut down. They lost a ton of students because they hadn't already made that commitment to getting people to training through that time anyway. People kind of did that in their, in their, um, uh, in their brains. Uh, Bonnie's sharing in the chat here, thank goodness for 12 months. No, I agree with you 100%, Bonnie. That was a mistake. Those that did not make that shift quickly and well did not do as well, all right? Jenny, I think you raised your hand there, did you? I don't know if you did that on purpose or not. You should be able to unmute yourself. And if you have questions, anybody has questions as I'm going through this, please go ahead and type those in the chat or we can help you out with those as well. All right, let me know. Let's let me know if you guys have questions on any of that, okay? Um, once again, investing in expensive equipment and other fixes. If you went in and you, you hired, you know, so you put some new kind of magic coating on your floor that killed all types of viruses and bacteria and the county shut the people down across the street down, they shut you down as well. All right. And so expensive fixes like that, that aren't going to be permanently helpful uh, to your studio was a mistake. Let's not make that same mistake going forward here. Okay. You can take that money you got from the loans or the bailout packages or whatever, you can spend it on much more profitable things than that. Uh, how did you manage burnout in yourself and your staff? And this was a big one, I think, because people just got tired of being on Zoom and doing whatever else it is that they need to do. So not having a specific strategy in place to manage burnout in yourself and in your staff was also a big mistake, okay? Now, this, most of you probably understand this already, but who retained the best? Younger students struggled more with online formats at first. 
That was not necessarily the case over time as people kind of started to figure that out. But younger students did struggle with, with more with online formats at first. Why is that important? Well, going forward, if you have to cut back on your capacity at your studio, for example, who do we give priority to? Well, if we can keep those little ones coming into classes, but we can't have the big ones in, we move the big ones onto Zoom. The ones that did the best, we, we can move onto the online platforms. And those that did not do as best, we kind of cater to them. And if we can keep them in our, in our, in our um, uh, studios and have them taking live classes still and do that safely, if that's possible to do in your area, then that's what we should do, right? We make the decisions based on that. But younger students did generally struggle more with online formats at first. Um, everybody struggles with it over time. Nobody wants to run their businesses that way in the long term, but they did struggle a little more with that. Uh, students that were not committed through the summer didn't stick around. So once again, 12 month programs, if you're running commitments to 12 month programs and following our scripts to get people to commit to that, you did better through the summer probably than those that did not do that. So committed through the summer, if they weren't committed through the summer, it's tough to get them to stick around. So long-term commitments is a big one. The other one is that the, the students that were over what we call the million dollar hump stayed committed. And some of you might not be familiar with that term, but what we mean when we talk about you know our, our program, the million dollar dance studio program, we're not just talking about how much money you can make out of your studio. We're talking about is creating a vision in your student's brain that they would not trade the experience they're having with you for a million dollars. That they, they recognize the experience they're having with you as valuable, and worth more than a million dollars. And so they would simply just not train it for a million dollars. New students didn't feel that way, right? New students were like, hey, this is a new thing. I'm trying this out. I'm just figuring this out. I don't know how good it is yet. New students were harder to retain, not because they were new students, but because they had not made it over the million dollar hump yet. And the sooner we can get people over that million dollar hump, in other words, how do we demonstrate this value? How do we demonstrate so much value to these new students that they're like, no, I'm doing this for the rest of my life, right? That they make that decision. Okay, how do, we, how do we demonstrate that much value? And if we can get students over the million dollar hump, it doesn't matter if they're new or if they're old, they're sticking around, even if we have to go temporarily back onto Zoom or shut the studio down for an extra week over the holidays or whatever happens, they're gonna stick around because they're over the million dollar hump, okay? All right, if you have any questions on that, let me know, but we'll, we, we can talk about that and help you guys learn how to do that. We do it mostly with the new student pipeline, right? That's mostly how, what, what does the heavy lifting and getting people over what we call a million dollar hump. All right, uh, people with more skin in the game remained enrolled as well. So if you, you if, if, if through COVID, you continue to take large down payments, so you're taking a $250 down payment, you're getting people, you know, committed to 12 months of, of classes, you're getting them into two classes a week and all that kind of stuff instead of just one. If you follow the scripts and you do that, those people remained enrolled better than the people who didn't. Now, this is, none of this is 100%, but in general, the people with more skin in the game remained enrolled better than the other ones. This is a big one. Strong leadership built trust and vision. The studio owners that kind of like wavered and were like, man, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to wait and find out, blah, 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 blah. They did not do as well. And so this is a really important lesson for everybody. Strong leadership built trust and vision. How is it that you want to react as we're going through wave number two or whatever happens in the future? You need to be in front of your people leading them. You need to be in front of your staff saying, we're going to keep everybody safe and we're going to keep everybody paid. And we're going to keep everybody in classes and here's how we're going to do it and you need to have that attitude and i realize that there's risk involved in doing that you are putting yourself in the crosshairs by doing that and it is still the right thing to do okay people want something to believe in they want something to hope for and if you can't be that thing maybe you should you know starbucks is hiring maybe you should be doing something else okay strong leadership built that trust and that vision you need to be that kind of person and you will retain better. Yeah, Wendy's sharing here, people need direction. I agree 100%. All right, five point framework. Now this is something that we kind of launched back in March we, with the intent of helping everybody know how to make decisions in this difficult time to make decisions. Everybody's looking for consensus. Everybody's looking for certainty. We wanna be certain that we're making the right decision and we want everybody else to be making the the same decision as us. Everybody wants consensus. Everybody wants certainty. You are not going to have either of those things if you do this the right way. You're not going to be doing it the same way everybody else does it, and you're not going to be certain of the decisions you make, okay? You just need to be okay with that. Instead, we use this little five-point framework. First priority is keep everyone safe, okay? What does that mean to you? Might mean something different for every studio, but it is your priority number one to make somebody, to keep everybody safe. So if you're trying to make a decision, about what you're doing moving forward. And one of the decisions does not keep people safe. Let's not make that decision. Let's not choose that option. So this is the, these are listed in order of priority. Number two is add value. 
How can we find ways to add value to our program, not decrease value, right? We stop offering as many classes. We don't do classes live. We just move them to an online recorded portal. So people are gonna watch a YouTube video basically. Like that's not adding value. How do we add value right now, okay? We wanna keep everybody safe first. Second thing is what I'm doing, is the decision I'm making adding value or not adding value? If it's not adding value, let's not make that decision. Okay, let's not do that. Number three, increase engagement with your students, with your parents and with your staff, all three of those. So as you're making a decision, should I do this thing? Should I change in this way? Well, does that increase engagement or decrease engagement? We wanna make sure that if, if it, if okay, cool, we're keeping everybody safe by doing this, cool, we're adding value by doing this. Now, are we increasing engagement or decreasing engagement? If the answer is decreasing engagement, don't do that thing, all right? Number four, pursue additional revenue. What are some ways that we can create some additional revenue for our studios? By the way, I'm going to share you a bunch with those in, with you in a second of what was most successful with our with our clients that we were working with. And, and it's not what you think. It's not just adding additional classes and selling them to people who live on the other side of the world, right? There, there are plenty of other ways to pursue additional revenue streams uh, that work very, very well and are continuing to work well and that you should focus on as well. I'll share them with you in a second here. And then plan for the ramp back up. And quite frankly, even though most of you right now probably as you're watching this video, especially those that are watching it live, you're probably looking at some shutdowns coming up or some limited capacity coming up in the next few weeks, especially through the and, and over the holidays. But you are still in the ramp back up. And our definition of what that means may be a little bit different than what most people are thinking here, but we are ramping things back up now. And the expectation is that there's like enough good news about what's happening in the future that we, we can much more clearly plan for getting back to normal as fast as we can. So we need to make sure that we're planning for the ramp back up. Number one, keeping everybody safe. This does not mean the same thing in every location. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, you know, in, in, in many rural locations, they were never really even completely shut down. In other places where COVID hit very, very hard, there are studios that are still shut down, okay? That, that are still not open again. So this does not mean the same thing in every location. And you need to keep that in mind. So there's no one piece of advice that we can give everybody that says, this is how you keep everybody safe. Everybody should be doing this thing because it does not mean the same thing in every location, all right? The other thing is perception is more important than reality. I was talking to Maisha about this a little bit earlier this morning. In her area, technically in their studios, they. They, they have some limited capacity restrictions, but nobody has to wear a mask, right? Well, that, that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there in the community that still think you should wear a mask, okay? So whether or not the, the, the reality reflects what people feel is not as important as whether or not we're marketing and messaging to the way that people feel, right? So perception of how people feel about whatever situation is going on in your area is much more important than what is actually going on. Let's keep everybody safe, but let's understand that some people think that you need to do more or less than you're currently doing, and that is a real thing, okay? That is a real thing. Now, some people won't, won't feel safe coming in no matter what you do. Stop trying to cater to them. Let's not market to them. There are enough people out there that do feel safe either coming into the studio or wearing a mask while training or social distancing or taking classes online or whatever it is. You know, let's market to those people that are willing to do those things. And the people that don't want to do those things, it's fine. Let's let them take care of themselves and, 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 and practice, um, you know, the, uh, if, if they have somebody who's immunocompromised at their home and they're very much more worried about coming out into public than other people might be, then we need, to, we need to understand that's absolutely fine. Let's not try and convince those people to go against what they believe is safe, in other words, okay? Let's not bother with that. Let's not try and convince people that something is safe that they don't think is safe, even if you think it's safe, all right? Some people are just not gonna feel that way. There's plenty of people out there. Let's mark for the people who do feel safe, easy. All right, that's it on that one. Add value. Now, focus on your higher level messaging. All right. It's not, you do not sell classes. You sell transformation. What is your higher level messaging? I want you focusing on that more in your messaging right now. Go update your website, go update your ads, whatever else you're doing. We don't just sell classes. We sell the result of the transformation and you need to make that explicit to everybody. What problems do your students have? Okay. What, what problems let's go ahead and have you share some of these in the chat. We've done this before. But as COVID hit and things shut down and students go to online classes and adults are in, um, you know, remote work from home in, you know, zooming into work from their living rooms all, all day, every day, what new problems does that create for people? Type some of those into the chat for us or raise your hand and we come around and talk about those, but help us with that. Let's brainstorm that for just a second. Take a moment and let's talk about that. What, what problems do they have? People need, uh, yeah, no social outlets. Exactly. That's a great one. Boredom. 
Too much screen time, Alice. That's a fantastic one. That's exactly right. All of a sudden, you know, parents that were doing a pretty good job of keeping their kids off of too much screen time every day have their kids spending eight hours on the screen all of a sudden, right? The, 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 there's all kinds of new problems that popped up uh, because of this. Uh, sharing in the chat here, managing work and kids at home at the same time. That's exactly right. Like these are problems that now um, our students and our parents have. So how can we go solve those problems for them? How can we solve those problems for them? What are some of the things that we can do? Uh, typing in again, Mary, loneliness and anxiety. Yeah, how can we solve the loneliness problem for people, Mary? How can we solve the anxiety problem for people? You do not sell dance classes. You sell solutions to people's problems, okay? Denise, talking about being healthy is important today. Cool, how can we help people with that? How can we solve that problem for them? Guess what? If you can continue to solve people's problems, you can continue to charge a premium amount for solving those problems, all right? Even if you have to do something differently right now than you normally did in the past. Great ideas that, we, that, that we've, we've been sharing on some of the group calls. Some of you doing story time with the kids, some of you doing happy hour with the parents where uh, the adults can get together and you know bring their own favorite beverage and, 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 and talk to each other on, on a Zoom call, like that kind of stuff. They were doing that in your lobby before you had to shut down and now they can't do that anymore and they missed that, right? Those of you that, some of you had for your older kids, I think somebody was talking last week about doing a, a virtual escape room and they figured out a great way to do that. And there's all of these things that we can be doing to be adding value right now. Um, uh, yeah, Ray sharing again here, or, or maybe it's Bonnie, families forming a stable schedule. They have problems with that right now. How can we solve those problems in addition to what we're currently solving for them, okay? How can we solve those additional problems? Implement first the things that are most sustainable. Now, I said this a little bit differently back in March, but what we said back in March was don't implement anything that you can't hang on to for at least three months, okay? So if you're doing some ridiculous over-the-top thing to add value, if you can't sort of sustain that for at least three months, don't implement it because this is not going to turn back on like a light switch, right? As we're ramping things back up. So implement first the things that are the most sustainable, right? What is it that you can sustain the best over time? Cool? All right. Now, number three is increasing. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's Bonnie or Ray chatting here. What's an example? I'm, I'm guessing you're asking an example of things that are not sustainable. Is that what you're asking there, Bonnie? Can you clarify your question for me? or raise your hand and I'll come around and unmute you if you want to. Yeah, so what are some things that are not sustainable? Well, for example, um, if you, if you uh, I, think, I think adding additional classes was a good example of this, right? And so, you know, every, every day we're gonna add these additional classes. We're gonna, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's not something that you're gonna be doing permanently or, or sustaining for a long time. Uh, let's not do those things, okay? Uh, if it, and, and it may be personal to you as well. It may just be that, you know, let me give you another example. Some studios uh, did not hang on to their staff and the owners decided they were just going to go teach all the classes because they uh, didn't want to have to pay their staff members. Uh, that's not sustainable. You can't go teach 20 classes a day and, and, uh, and, and expect that to be sustainable for a really long time. Also, losing your staff members because you're not keeping them enrolled is, is not sustainable. You're going to need to bring those people back. Denise is sharing in the chat here, free is not sustainable. You know, offering free classes and dropping your tuition down to zero was not a sustainable thing. That was the problem with that, okay? So there are lots of things like that. Um, another one would be, um, I, you know, I, 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 I think just it, you personally, if you, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you have an experience where you're like, hey, I have this idea to add value, I'm gonna do this thing. Are you able to do that for a long amount of time. And if you're not able to do that for, in, for three months, then don't implement that thing, okay? What are some sustainable examples? Now she's, exam she, she's saying, um, it, I think that, I think that um, for a lot of you guys, like having, having like the next fun thing on the calendar, what's the next fun thing? So in my studio right now, we anticipate being shut down, but we're still working on some uh, choreo choreography with our student base because, and we're gonna have these, uh, this videographer come in and uh, film everybody's uh, piece in a socially distanced way, right? And then put together a really nice video presentation rather than doing some kind of live show or whatever. Like th that kind of thing is a temporary thing. It's an absolutely sustainable thing. It's not something that I'm promising that I'm gonna do for the ongoing for forever, okay? Uh, other things I think if you are capable, well, once again, Bonnie, this is gonna come down to your, the amount of like capability that you have. If every Friday you can have some kind of a socially 
uh, a stimulating thing for your teenage students to do together on Friday nights because they can't go do whatever else they were doing uh, temporarily and you can sustain that for at least three months, let's go ahead and implement that. If doing story time with the little bitty kids and having them um, come in and do that kind of a thing is, is, is something that works for you, let's have them come in and do that, okay? Uh, Jenny's saying here, we did a private Facebook group where they could post the challenges we gave to the dancers and build community and help them practice at home. That's a great example as well. So adding these additional like social media groups that people can interact on, um, those kind of things, very, very sustainable options. Okay, those are all sustainable options. Mostly, I think it's giving them something in the future to look forward to. Okay, giving them something in the future to look forward to as best as we can. Those are very easily sustainable things as well. All right, okay, good questions. Increasing engagement. All right, what do I mean when I talk about your DNS system? Now, it, there was a, one of the problems when a lot of people first moved to Zoom and is gonna happen again is people have to move back to Zoom if they have to do that, is that they lost the engagement with the students. The DNS system was by far the most important thing that you could implement to make sure that engagement stayed high. What do I mean by the DNS system? Who knows what that is? Some of you in the mastermind that know already what that system is, what are we talking about with the DNS system? It's your did not show system, that's right. It's the people who miss class, we reach out and contact them and make sure that they're okay. And you need a system with that in place. It's the same thing that you would do if your studio was just regular and open. If they're missing class, we contact them and find out why. Remember, somebody missing class is the clearest indication that they're planning on quitting or that they're, that they're at risk of quitting. So we wanna make sure that we increase engagement with the students that are not engaging. It was harder to do over COVID. It absolutely was during those first shutdowns. There were a lot of people that were missing their Zoom classes. We still think it's an important thing to do. And we saw that the studios that implemented that got better engagement through COVID, okay? What, what do we do in our studios when attrition rises? So if that happens anyway, like what are the other things? That, if you run a studio and you're not doing a good job of retaining your students at a certain time of year, what are the things you go fix? It's not just teach better classes. Hopefully you already have that in place right? DNS system is one of the things. What are the other things we do? If attrition is high, what are the other things that we implement to make sure that the, the attrition doesn't go up? Denise is saying, yeah, communication, clear communication. Man, you just fire off an email, inspect everybody to open up that email and read it. It ain't going to happen, man. We need several lines of communication, sending out emails, sending out text messages, making phone calls, posting stuff to these private Facebook groups. All of those things need to get information out to people through several channels, not just one, okay? So when attrition goes up in your studio, what is it that you're working on that will help them do that? 12-month program commitments, long-term commitments, upgrades, putting ranking systems in place. All of those things help with engagement and all of those things you should be doing even when COVID isn't a thing, right? So let's make sure that if you have that problem, that you're doing that more anyway. Get creative with homework assignments, social media groups, video production, and those kind of things. Let's get creative with that so that we can increase the engagement. Let's create buddies where the older students are mentoring the younger students and you give them an assignment to interact a certain way. You know, what is it that we can do? How can we get creative to increase engagement, right? Additional revenue streams. Now, there were a lot of ideas that were originally kind of bantered around back at the beginning of the first COVID shutdowns. There were some that worked significantly better than others. Anybody want to take any guesses? Well, first one was implement an aggressive down payment. If you hadn't had this in place yet, that was the time to implement. If you didn't implement then, implement now. If you're charging $250 down payment or a $200 down payment or a $99 down payment or whatever you're doing, every time a new student enrolls, that increases cash flow, right? And we need to be prepared for times like your studio may be getting shut down to increase cash flow. So implementing an aggressive down payment or raising your down payment if you didn't do that. How many of you that were working with us still at the beginning of the year heard me say to people, raise, you know, hey, we're having trouble enrolling people in our online classes. Cool, let's raise your down payment. Like that's the solution to that. That's how we create greater urgency is by raising the down payment, not by lowering the down payment. I just, I felt like a, a broken record telling so many people that over the last several months. It's absolutely still true, okay? Uh, get more paid in full agreements from old and from new students. Now we need cash in the studio when we're running into, you know, catastrophes. And so getting paid in full students, somebody, somebody shared that win at the beginning of the call today. Getting people to pay in full and to give us those paid in full agreements is a huge cash flow boon. If you've got a $2,000 average student value and you sign up five new students, that's 10 grand in additional cash flow. 
every additional $10,000 helps. Old students, okay? So let's reach out to the old students, the students that already think you're awesome and love you. And you say to them, hey, if you'll pay for, you know, a year of classes coming up here, we'll give you this 10% discount as much. For some of you that are that have these students taking as many classes as they do that have been around with you for a long time, that's four or $5,000 even with the discount, okay? There's plenty of additional revenue in getting people to pay in full. Offer online classes to a wider audience. Now, there were some people that were doing this. Once again, my, my criticism here is that it is hard to sustain. So if you can sustain this for at least three months, then continue to do it. That's absolutely fine. But if you can't, then I want you to be a little bit critical of this one. Though we had people that found out that once, once we'd moved our classes online, uh, students that had trained with us in the past and moved out of the area, they actually reached out to us and asked to be added back onto the uh, enrollment so that they could take these classes online as well. So that's another option that you can be doing. Um, bring in a broader instructor base. So we saw a lot of people do a lot of this. Uh, this was a great success for um, I, some of you heard um, Ephra sharing those experiences uh, a, a number of months ago where he was bringing people in from other countries to teach these classes to the students and, and have these um, interviews and things that they could do over Zoom so students could ask these you know, important questions to these, to these people who were part of their legacy, you know, in their, in their, in their lineage and their training and those kind of things. Those kinds of, those kinds of experience were great ways to add additional revenue, but also to be adding value as well. So bringing in that broader instructor base went a really long way, I think. And then continue to enroll new students while future pacing them. So in other words, you don't say, hey, we'll bring you in and, and enroll you in classes when we open up again. You say, let's get you enrolled now and then with the intent to get you back into live classes when we open back up again, right? There's, that's two different things. We're not putting off enrollments just because we're temporarily online. Let's get these people enrolled so we can get them started and then they're not behind or whatever your justification is, but let's get the people enrolled while future pacing them. And it's funny that, to say enroll students as an additional revenue stream, but a majority of students didn't do that. They stopped enrolling new students while they were shut down. And the studios that didn't do that, that they had that additional revenue stream that their competitors did not. Leverage, scarcity, and urgency for additional enrollments. So in other words, um, there are, there are um, COVID gave us some messaging, right? COVID did a good job of giving us some messaging, I think that was important, that allowed us to say things like, hey, look, we don't know what's gonna happen. So if you wanna sign up, you better sign up right now, right? Basically, it gave us a bunch of messaging that allowed us to create that scarcity and create that urgency for people to sign up right now. Um, the, the, Theo says that it's worked well for us during being currently shut down. Yeah, that's exactly my point. You know, like pivoting to 12 month programs, implementing large down payments, getting people into classes now instead of later because hey, they may pull back and we may not be able to enroll you two months from now because we can't put 10 people in class, we can only put eight people in class. Like all of those things, all of that messaging was handed to us by COVID. So we need to make sure that we're leveraging that Leverage that scarcity and ur urgency for additional enrollments, okay? You, you have more scarcity in your classes right now, more urgency, more reasons to enroll right now than you did in the past. And the irony of all of that is that what most studios did was they reacted to COVID in the opposite way. Well, let's just put it off. Well, we'll get you signed up when studio opens back up again and we're not online. And that was a mistake, okay? It's additional revenue stream. By, it seems hilarious to me. Your additional revenue stream is that you're enrolling students still, but that's not what most studios did, okay? Number five, plan for the ramp back up. Uh, what is that going to look like for you? Well, we, we don't know, of course, everywhere in every area. Um, my state, uh, my governor just announced earlier today that they're on some kind of a fast track trial for getting some of the most at-risk people vaccinated. Some states aren't gonna do the same thing. So, so me ramping up in my area may look different than it does in your area, I don't know. Um, but what I can tell you is that it's not gonna be a light switch, okay? that the ramp back up is going to be something that happens over time, not just from one day to the next. A lot of people attach a lot of newness to the new year, right? We set new goals and we, we, we put 2020 behind us and we get into 2021 and guess what? Just 2021 opening back up again, you know, being a new year doesn't magically mean that every problem that you've ever had is gonna be fixed just because it's a new year. So we need to be thinking through this, right? What is this gonna look like for you in your area? Some areas still not shut down, some areas still shut down. It's gonna be different for everybody. What I can tell you is that the ramp back up is not gonna be a light switch, um, but we wanna be very aggressive in our reactions to that ability to open back up again, okay? What positive permanent changes can you make because of COVID? Uh, does the shutdown give you an excuse to be running 12 month programs through the summer? Does it give you an excuse to be charging large down payments because you weren't doing that? 
Does it give you an excuse to uh, put your upgraded systems in place so that you're better off, uh, you're better at getting those lower level students into higher level students? Has it given you an excuse to just finally pull the trigger on that stuff? So what positive permanent changes can you make because of COVID? And how can we do this as quickly and efficiently as possible? Look, I know that you feel like if you wait, you will be, you will have some perfect solution in the future. And so you wait in, in, to implement because you're gonna figure everything out. You're not gonna figure everything out. Let's get to the good enough point. Let's pull the trigger on stuff and then fix problems as we need to fix problems. People are gonna push back on the changes you make. That's fine. Let's go handle those on an individual basis. You're not gonna come up with some system that's gonna be perfect the first time you launch it. Let's not expect that, okay? Uh, Theo says, no parents in the lobby, uh, hashtag permanent. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a great example there, Theo, as well. Thanks uh, thanks for sharing that. That does seem to be something that uh, that is going well for us as well. Uh, that's fantastic. Okay, great. Yeah, and Mary says she's going to be implementing everything I just said. So that's good, Mary. Yeah, let's use this as an excuse. This is a great excuse. Uh, Jenny's saying, uh, COVID has been so good for me to just make a decision and go with it, even though I don't have all the information right then. Yeah, that's exactly what I said at the beginning of the five point framework here. Everybody wants consensus. Everybody wants certainty. You're not going to have either. Sorry about that. We're going to be strong leaders and we're going to deal with this stuff anyway. Okay. All right. How do we do that quickly and efficiently? Strong leadership is key. Decide what you're doing, accept that what you are going to be, that, that you are going to be wrong sometimes, and then take responsibility. Decide what you're doing, accept that you're gonna be wrong about some things, and then take responsibility when you are. That's it, super, super easy. Those are the kinds of people that other people want to follow. And you're not gonna have consensus, you're not gonna have certainty, decide, accept that you're wrong sometimes, Take responsibility when you are, okay? Those are the kinds of people that, that our staff wants to follow. Those that retain staff really well did that. They acted that way. Um, that's th that's exactly right. Deborah's saying, I've learned so much from this and for the business, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, Deborah, this, is, this has been great. It's like training with weights at the gym, okay? Not something we necessarily want to do, but if you implement these things right way, you, 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 you act as this strong leader as you're going through this, you're gonna be better off as you do. Going forward, build up cash reserves. Now, if you haven't been taking notes, this is where you start taking notes. This, this last little slide here. Build up your cash reserves, okay? Build them up. Reset your financial thermostat. So many studios basically do their accounting based on looking at how much money is in their bank account, deciding what they can spend money on. They go spending all the money in their bank account. That's a mistake, okay? I know you might have wanted to, you know, refinish the floor one extra time or paint the walls or buy those new costumes for the next show or whatever that thing happens to be. But maybe you ought to reset your financial thermostat. So maybe the amount of money that you keep on reserve is not high enough to throw the red flag, okay? So like if you have to get down to almost zero in your bank account before there's a red flag and you go do something, you need to reset your financial thermostat, okay? I want more money in your account. When you drop below $150,000 in your bank account, I want that red flag to go off, right? I want your financial thermostat set much higher. Now, I'm, I'm being facetious there, of course, but I want you to I want you to just like what you're comfortable with having on reserves. I want that to be not quite as much as I want it to be more than it was in the past. Oh, well, less than it was in the past, right? So in other words, in other words, I want you to feel a little bit anxious when there is more money in your account than there was in the past. Does that make sense? Okay, so build up those cash reserves. Go get those down payments. Go get those large down payments. Go get those 12 month commitments. Go get those, go raise your tuition aggressively. Go get those paid in fulls. Uh, use this as an opportunity to push back on your landlord, please. Even if your landlord told you no earlier in the year, go push again. Even if they tell you a no again now, I want you to go try and renegotiate those leases and get better deals and all that kind of stuff. You are building an emotional bank account there. And the, 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 the building owner is going to feel bad, basically, if I can simplify that, for having to tell you no, 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 no to all the things you're requesting now. And even if they do continue to tell you no, that's fine. Going forward, the next thing that you ask, you're more likely to get a yes out of them because you're building that, that, that uh, financial bank account. But if they do say yes, once again, don't take that money and go spend it on an expensive trip to Mexico, right? Let's go, let's take that money and let's keep it in our cash reserves. Let's build up those cash reserves. Um, you are going to need that even if COVID blows over in your area really quickly, okay? 
you're going to need those cash reserves to ramp things back up as aggressively as we're going to want you to be doing things, right? Don't stop advertising through the shutdowns, please. Don't stop advertising through the shutdowns. If you get limited in your classes and you can't add any new students, do not go turn off 100% of your advertising. Keep stuff out there. Let's go build waiting list for classes. Leverage scarcity and urgency. We've been handed some messaging, take advantage of it. Oh man, you better get in right now because we don't know what's gonna happen next week, right? We better get you in sooner than later because we don't know what's gonna happen in the new year, right? All of those, leverage that, take advantage of that. It's being handed to you. Enroll new students and build waiting lists if necessary. Build the waiting list if you can't enroll the new students. But if you can enroll new students, don't just build waiting lists to wait until you know, next month or whatever, when you think things are gonna go open back up again. Enroll the new students, get them in, set them up, come up with whatever that offer you can't refuse is that you're using in the script for the enrollment conference. And let's, let's get these people signed up and in the door, okay? Or online or whatever you're doing. If marketing is working, now this is important. If marketing is working, and, and your average student value is increasing, increase capacity, right? If marketing is working and average student value is increasing, if both of those things are true, if you're doing a good job of getting people into upgraded programs, you're getting them into multiple en enrollments, if you're getting down payments, if you're getting, if all that's working and, you're, and your marketing's working, increase your capacity. What do I mean by that? Well, even in spite of limited class sizes, okay, uh, uh, and Theo, I see your question. Let me finish this last point. And we'll come back and we'll answer all of those questions that you guys have here. That's a, that's a good question, Theo. So remind me in a second here. But let me let me finish this last point on the slide here. If marketing is working and average student value is increasing, even if you're in limited capacity, so you can only have you know half as many students in a class or in the building or whatever as you currently can, I want you to find ways to increase that capacity. If that means adding additional classes to your to your schedule, if that means renting out a temporary facility down the street to put new uh, classes in or move your advanced students to and keep your, your lower level guys in the current location, you know, what does that mean? Even in spite of limited class sizes, if your marketing is working and your average student value is increasing, be watching for the opportunity, okay? If that means we gotta go find you a new location, if that means that we need to add classes to your schedule, if that means we need to hire new instructors to teach additional classes, do that. If marketing's not working, your average student value isn't increasing, don't. Let's go fix those two things first. But if you're in this other position, then I don't care that the COVID you know, limitations are currently on you. I want you finding ways to increase capacity for more students if those other two things are true, okay? So if, the, if you don't know if those two things are true, ask me and I'll help you look at your stats and we'll figure that out. Um, but if your marketing's working and your average student value is going up and you're limited in some capacity, you can't put more students in this class because your, your county health department is not letting you, go add additional classes, go find an additional location, whatever we need to do. Uh, I promise you, as we're ramping things back up, that's going to be important and you're going to regret that you didn't do that and you didn't focus on that if, if you're in the position that I'm saying here. Marketing's working, average student value is increasing, increase your capacity, man. Knock down that wall, add that additional room, hire that additional structure, whatever it is we need to do. Um, you're going to regret not doing that when it's time to ramp back up as aggressively as we're going to um, get everybody ramped back up, okay? All right. Now, there were a couple of other questions I think that I didn't quite get to here. Uh, 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 Theo's question, how do we keep a waiting list student that is new? How do we keep them engaged? That's an awesome question, Theo. Let's chat about that a little bit. And I think there's a couple of good options for that. If anybody has any insight on that that you guys want to share, uh, please let us know. Uh, but, but Theo, the idea with all of those guys is to stay in front of them and leverage that scarcity still. So you say, hey, look, Theo, can you raise your hand? Maybe you can't chat. I know you said you might be listening as you're, as you're driving. But if you can chat, let's unmute you there. Can you unmute yourself? Are you there, Theo? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. So, Theo, first of all, uh, the waiting list that I'm that I'm referring to here mostly are the waiting. Like, why are people on the waiting list? They're on the waiting list probably because you have limited class sizes. Is that fair? That is fair. Yes. And so, first and foremost, what we want them to do is understand that that's why they're on a waiting list, so that they know that the moment that you get an opening they better jump on it because they're going to go back on the waiting list if they don't. Right. So we want them to be aware of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that so, tends to work better with our students that are currently in the school. Like we have a very popular preschool teacher. She's like, just like, everybody wants that class. Everybody wants that class. She teaches seven or eight classes. 
but uh, and so whenever they want to move to a different time they're, or they're going on vacation for three weeks and want to like n- like disenroll if that's the word then yeah. we use that scarcity thing they're like you know what you're right we're just going to stay in Works that's exactly both. right and and theo if you will use that same thing like j- just take that attitude when a new intro comes in a new person you're talking to them they're going through your prospect pipeline and you're talking to them and you say look we would love to have you in here, but I, I got You got to understand that we, we're we're operating under some scarcity right now, and we just don't have any room in that class. But we expect the spot to open up soon. But as soon as it opens, you got to jump on it. Does that make sense? Do you understand? You you know, like you were driving that point home with them. And right. if you will have that attitude, what that does is it it creates that desire in them. So they don't know that this instructor is your favorite instructor or whatever it is. But that's the attitude that we're taking, and they will follow with that same attitude. Does that? I'm gonna change change the, the, the psychology a little bit to ask your, your, yep. to, kind of for you to drive the point home. It, so I, you know, little Sally's coming up and they want to take dance and they're really excited. She looks like she's going to pee her pants, whatever. And, but there, we have a new class we're starting and we're going to put you on the waiting list. We can't start that class yet. Cause you're the only kid in it. Don't How tell do- them the only kid in it, but otherwise, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay. Then um, how do we, because that's a that's a real time situation. So I, I guess I'm looking for language, and that is that take, is smart. Yeah, take, true, don't say that. take take at least the cost of the intro class, if not a down payment on the program. Well, I'm not kidding, man. Like if there if like you don't even have the class yet, but what's your intro you're running right now, Theo? What is it? Twenty nine. Twenty nine ninety nine. Okay, so you're running twenty. I'd take the twenty nine ninety nine and say, look, uh, we're building a waiting list for this class right now. We're waiting to hear back for exactly when we can pull the trigger on it. We expect it to happen in the next blah, 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 whatever the time is that you expect it to happen. And then you say, and then you say, so if you'd like to make that $20, $29 thing, we can guarantee you a spot in that class when it opens up, but we mm. can't do that unless you do that. And let's get them financially engaged as well, because those people that are financially engaged in their brain, they are enrolled, right? right? In their right. brain, they've made that much more skin in the game that made that commitment. Mm-hmm. So if we can get them financially committed, then let's do that, right? Uh, Even if you don't exactly have a class. What I did. That's exactly what I need because I've been, you know, Anthony and I have been on working with our staff and getting them trained. It's, you know, a new problem. You know, we really dri- driven home on making sure that they understand when someone leaves without a commitment, which is financial, they are not coming back. We just say they're not coming back. If you didn't get any money from them, they are not coming back. It is that's really hard. It is really hard. Yep. You're exactly we just right. tell them they're not coming back. They go, yep, well, they said they exactly loved right. it, but they're not coming back. <laughs> yep. That's exactly right. So if you can get that, I mean, even if even if you don't know what class they're going in yet and you guys have to hustle and go set something up, you go set something up. But if you can get them to make at least the commitment to the intro price so they can come in and try out the class, uh, absolutely that will help them to be more engaged as well. That is perfect. That answers my question. Thank you very good? much. Okay. Good question though, Aunt, uh, Theo. That's that's exactly what you guys should be doing. And I expect this to be a major problem with you guys now that you have everything kind of set up and and running those ads. It sounds like it sounds like this is going to be your next problem. Like yeah. we're going to have to we're going to have to find more space and more teachers and more classes and that kind of stuff sounds like. We're lucky that we in our in our one of our locations, we have another building that we have not used a lot. Fan using. So we have we have Fantastic. we actually have a large capacity to continue to build in. The problem will be staffing in terms yes. of staffing. Yep. yep. So we we're love causing you new problems, Theo. We love causing you new problems. Now here's the thing that I was gonna say though. Don't ignore that last statement that I made in the little presentation. If the marketing's working and you guys are doing a pretty good job of increasing your average student value, pull the trigger on even if you're limited capacity, even if all those other things are true, pull the trigger on finding ways to either you know, get that back room cleaned out or get some new staff members hired or whatever it is we need to do. Because as you're ramping back up, I promise you're going to wish you had done it um, because we're going to try and ramp everybody back up super aggressively as things open back up again. On it, making new problems and solving okay. them. I like it. Yeah. Thank you. Cash, cash flow and ramp up if those other two things are true. 